welcome to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. I'm Justin, parish lay minister, also organist, St. Stephen Lutheran, joining you today. Exciting to be here, and it's a whole lot different weather than the last time I was here, which was the last time we had such a gully washer, so wonderful to see the sunshine out this morning. Uh, In your comings and goings, you'll see the October the 21st, have the fall cleanup. Your Reformation Sunday on October the 29th with a trunk or treat and Oktoberfest. Ooh, let me move this down just a little bit so I don't puff and blow in too much. Uh, this morning, we'll have our regular offering as well as the noisy offering. Oh, uh, let's see. And Linda. You needed to make an announcement. Uh, I've got a sign up pitch for the uh, Oktoberfest uh, hot dogs and some of the frogs. The cheese. Whatever we call it, uh, Oktoberfest Sunday. Uh, I'm not going to be out. They sell them actually until weekend after that. So I'll be out of town next weekend. And I would like to, if you plan to come, go ahead and put your name on it. It's on the sign, maybe on the sign up sheet, but on the bulletin board out there, it's on the sign up for a bulletin board. And uh, just write down your name and how many you're here. So, so if you plan to go to the point, you can get two good ones. Good morning. Good morning. Our beloved pastor who is moving on has uh, sent me a epistle from her email <coughs> account and it said you might enjoy this for stewardship. <laughs> As I'm head of stewardship uh, we're going to start having uh, a few messages for you, as well as the time and talent sheets will be coming out pretty quick. So when you get those, <clears throat> please don't just think of your contribution only as monetary. There's a great deal that can be done in this church, especially where we're at now, that, that would help us if you sign up on the time and talent sheets as well. She sent me a uh, message. It's, it's uh, about bringing in the sheaves, and uh, this time of year has always been stewardship time, and uh, she kind of sent this so I can help explain how that started a little bit. And uh, the, the, the verse <coughs> that starts it, where your treasure is, where your heart will be also, and that's Matthew 6, 21st chapter. It says, I guess I ask frequently why most nonprofits, but especially churches, run stewardship appeals in autumn. The agrarian cycle of our ancestry lives on in many ways in this world, and this pattern is no exception. In autumn, farmers would know the gifts that they would have on hand for the coming year, both monetarily and otherwise. And so it was, at this time of year, they were able to make their pledge of God's mission in their local parish. Like so many things in our world, this tradition remains strong and in many ways remains logical. After all, it was not so many weeks ago that Sunday schools kicked off in most parishes in the United States. It was not so many weeks ago that the yellow t-shirts and God's work, our hands logos filled social media as congregations reaffirmed their commitment to loving God and their neighbor through acts of love, service, and kindness. Schools start again. The holiday, holy day rush begins again. In many ways, autumn remains a time of beginning in the lives of humanity, even as the earth in this part of the hemisphere begins to go out in the blaze of glory. It remains a good time to talk about stewardship, but instead of campaigns or even appeals, I think the community of Christ should call them invitations to renew generosity. After all, 
our agrarian ancestors were really deciding how to use God's generous harvest to multiply that generosity through their faith communities. The same remains true for us. Our ancestors, the ancient Christian Celts, would do this cool thing at this time of year. As their last fields were gathered, they'd all come together to raise up the final sheaf and they'd process it back into town, giving thanks to God that God was generous again that year. They'd celebrate the generosity of the divine, both in the harvest and through the gifts of Christ for the world. They do as the old hymn and many hymnals sing, come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. I wonder if every stewardship appeal, every invitation to renew generosity, could be a scene of rejoicing as you, as a community, gather around the generous, crucified, and risen one. Brings in the collective sheaves to continue changing life in this world. Come rejoicing, beloved, bringing in the generous sheaves God has given you. Thank you. Any visitors with us this morning? Oh, but we do have one. We have our pianist today. I'm sorry. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for being here and being a part of our service this morning. And your son, Chris. Welcome. We're glad to have you this morning. Let us uh, share in our mission statement, saying it together. We, the people of Holy Trinity, are called to glorify God by building vibrant relationships with Jesus and joyfully sharing his message with others. And I invite you now, share peace with one another. The peace of the Lord be with you always. All right, let us pray. Most merciful God, we come this morning with open hearts, open minds, seeking your message for us that as we go from this place, we would be the children of light to this community. Thank you for this beautiful, cool weather that we're experiencing this morning, bringing about that experience of fall. Thank you for the opportunity to come right here into your house and spend just a few moments with you, thanking you for each and every blessing. Lord, we also lift up those right now who need prayer, spoken and unspoken, known to all, and unknown. Lord, we ask that you would just put your loving arms around each and every one of us. Let us feel your presence in this place. Thank you, Lord, for each and every blessing. Undeserved, you gave your life for us, that we may be your children, and we are so grateful for that opportunity. Bless us now, Lord, bless this church. Bless our community in your precious and loving name. Amen. And let's enjoy some beautiful music by Robin as we do open our hearts and our ears to the message this morning. <laughs>
I invite you to stand. Blessed be the God, blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and our forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our opening hymn this morning, Jesus Loves Me. And I invite you to sing this with joy and conviction. For he does love you and he loves me where we're at right now and where we will be when we leave this place. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Yeah. 
Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And I invite you to be seated. A reading, Exodus 20. The God of the Exodus graciously gave Israel the Ten Commandments, primarily stated as negative imperatives. The Ten Commandments forbid gross sins such as murder, adultery, theft, and perjury. In most of life, they grant Israel freedom. They grant Israel freedom to live righteously. Which maximum love, with maximum love from God and neighbor. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out to the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not have no, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make your, you shall not make yourself an idol, whether it is, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your God, I mean, to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance, and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we listen, but do not let God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you, so that you do not sin. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. To you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son, But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, 
Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace mercy and peace from God our Father and His Son Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning's gospel lesson focuses on the parable of the wicked tenants. We see how a landowner has built the very finest vineyard money could buy and leased it to tenants. When the harvest came, the master sent out his slaves to collect his produce. And this is where the parable takes a dreadful turn. And we learn there are hidden meanings through the people, the things, and the happenings in this parable. Have you ever stopped to notice when people in authority challenge Jesus? He often responds to their challenges with a parable or two, if the first one, especially if the first one does not suffice. The parable begins with the business as usual situation, a vineyard and who has built a very fine vineyard, sparing no expense. He has a watchtower, a fence, and a wine press all built from the very beginning, which I learned this week in studying. Many times a vineyard takes two to three years to begin to produce adequate fruit. The landowner then returns to his own country. The tenants were in charge of overseeing the productivity of the vineyard and paying their rent at the time of harvest in shares of the produce. Notice when the owner's slaves arrive to collect his share of the produce, the tenants attack them, killing and stoning each of them. The owner then simply sends in a larger group Something just is not right. Those slaves were treated worse than the first. You would think at this point the owner would send in troops or some form of law enforcement. But he doesn't. He sends his own son. Thinking by logic that things that these thugs who abuse two delegates of slaves will respect his son. How foolish. The tenants reason if they kill the son, they will get his inheritance. Are you still following? Because now we come to the punchline. Jesus asks his audience, the chief priests and elders, now when the owner comes to the vineyard, what will he do to the tenants? And they respond, he will put them to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give the produce at the harvest time. Whether the answer was given in gloating or as a lament depends on where they were at that time. The chief priests and elders probably see themselves as the landowner and victim of the unscrupulous tenants and would be ready and eager to pronounce judgment on them. Jesus in this parable afterward, Jesus in parable after parable is trying to slap the religious leaders awake. They are the problem, not the solution. Their pride has perverted God's covenant with Israel. The Father has sent the prophets, the Baptist, and now he sends his own son. 
Over and over again, God tells them to repent. But they love the perks too much and sit self-satisfied. For them, temple life is glorious. They have a good thing going. Why fix what's broken? They don't, just, they don't serve God's people. They lord over them. They don't feed the faithful. They milk them dry. Once again, Jesus being deadly serious, sees the cross and is ready to pay the price knowing that his unspeakable pain will bring infinite gain. Jesus says the kingdom of God will be given to a people who will produce its fruit through life, death, and resurrection. And we are those people. We have been chosen. We are the stone the builder rejected. And God is our rock of ages. This week while I was studying, I came across a story about a builder of fine homes in an upscale suburban suburb that spoke to me. The builder was known as a very creative craftsman, a shrewd businessman, a fair-minded employer, and generous benefactor. As he was now aging, he decided to go to Florida for the winter and approached his top superintendent and said to him, I want you to build me a home, the finest home this company has ever built, and spare no expense. Use the finest materials, employ the most gifted tradesmen, and build me a masterpiece before I come home next spring. The next day, the superintendent set out to build that home, but not exactly to order. Because he felt that since the boss was retiring, he would be losing his job. So he needed to pay his own, needed to pad his own savings account so that he would not be destitute. He used inferior concrete blocks for the foundation hired inexperienced carpenters, plumbers, and electricians, roofers, and landscapers, but charged the boss the premium price for the master craftsman, putting the difference in his own bank account. He installed cheap appliances and lighting, insufficient insulation, inferior carpet, and drafty windows. In the spring, when the home was finished and the boss returned, the superintendent's account had grown by hundreds of thousands of dollars. When the elderly business owner arrived home from Florida that spring, he toured the home and said it truly was fit for a king and was ecstatic. The superintendent handed him the keys and thanked his boss for the privilege of working for him all these years. And then the owner did an unthinkable thing. He said to the superintendent, you have been a trusted friend and a loyal partner in my business for all these years. You deserve a home like this. And he handed him the keys. Greed is what that story is all about. And greed is everywhere. Human greed and selfishness surround us every day. And that's why this parable Jesus tells us today in Matthew is so timely and relevant. Just as that wise home builder knew the heart of his superintendent, so Jesus knows our heart and our desires. And we need to change our ways. In today's parable, Jesus tells us how the renters got greedy and were resentful. They felt like after taking care of the vines, harvesting the grapes, and then taking them to market, the landowner should not have the, receive, the landowner should not receive the same as they did for the sale. The workers felt it was not fair. They cried, we deserve better. Just as can be said today by those consumed by greed, no, they did not, and we do not. But greed tells us we deserve so much more and so much better. 
Jesus concludes the parable by asking the Pharisees, when the owner of that vineyard finally shows up, what do you think he will do with the renters? The Pharisees responded, he will kill the renters for their greed, take the vineyard away from them, and give it to someone who is faithful in paying rent. Jesus replied, right you are. And God will do the same with you. In the last line, the Pharisees realized Jesus was speaking of them. And they wanted to arrest him and made plans to kill him. He was speaking of us. Duh. But that is the way it is with greed. If we are good at it, we don't think we're being greedy. We're simply taking what we have rightfully earned. If we are really good at it, we point to others and blame them for their selfishness, their unethical and hurtful behavior. Who's to blame for the high cost of a gallon of gas? Exxon, of course. Who's to blame for the high cost of health care? Insurance companies, of course. It's not our fault. Our hands are clean. Our motives are always pure. Our actions always selfless. Just in case you miss something in the readings from the gospel, he was talking to us in that parable. Just like every other parable Jesus ever told. We can never fully understand the parables until we put ourselves in that starring role of every one of the parables he told. The wicked renters are us. We've been placed in the most lush vineyard. We have essentially been given everything we need for life. Our food, clothing, shelter, meaningful work, family, friends, church, and community. It ought to be enough, but for so many, it is not. We often in, in society refuse to acknowledge that he is the source of everything we have, but then the rent comes due and we refuse to acknowledge that he is the source. The rent God seeks from us is our time. There are 168 hours in a week, and yet we begrudge being asked to spend one hour in worship each week to give thanks and reflect on his mercy, forgiveness, and love. The rent God seeks in our abilities. We have been gifted with amazing talents and skills but we often dismiss what we can do and covet what someone else has done. The hundredth Psalm opens with the words, make a joyful noise all you lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. It closes with the words, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Notice he did not say the voice has to be operatic for him to hear you. He hears you when the voice is weak and unstable, flat and tired. He longs for us to remember to be grateful for the gifts he has given. As a church organist, pianist for over 35 years, of which I am grateful every day for the ability to read music and share each week, I love, love to hear someone singing or speaking a word of praise to God for a gift freely given. The Lutheran Church is the first church I've served in that I truly gained my greatest joy in listening to the singing of a congregation. We may not always know the tune, but we give it everything we have. And then after the service, go by the organist and say, we might need to work on that some other time. 
I've never heard someone in church say, we can't sing that hymn ever again. The rent God seeks is a portion of our money. Everything we have in this world actually belongs to God and is simply on loan to us. He asks that we use what we have and return a portion to him for the work of the kingdom. But we forget to pay the rent. Or do we refuse to pay the rent? And then complain that the church always speaks about money. The rent God seeks is righteous living. But sin, greed, and selfishness are weeds in our lives. God can accept that. He knows we're sinners. But we fa what we fail to do is confess our shortcomings to this gracious God. We try to hide our sins or justify them. We compare our sins to our neighbors and take pride that we sin much less than they do. And God cries out, how can I forgive you if you insist there is nothing to forgive you for? In 1 John chapter 3, we are told, whoever abides in me sins not. Little children, let no man deceive you that he, does righteous, that he that does righteousness is righteous. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. For in our hearts, for our hearts condemn us. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Whatever things we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. In this parable today from Matthew, Jesus is speaking to us. No, let me correct myself. He's speaking to me. I have met the wicked renter. It's me. But I've also met the landowner and find him to be a gracious God who gives me lots of second chances, gives me more time, but his patience will not last forever. And I vow today and hope you will too to take a look at our own lives and confess and correct the greed that lies within us. I invite you also, my fellow renters, to join me. The vineyard is ours to use. The landowner is ours to love. And his is the purpose to forgive us. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to stand as we sing verses 1, 3, and 5 of the church's one foundation.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in the transformation and the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the word, the world, and all in need. God of grace, you are the source of life and joy. Strengthen the resolve of your church throughout the world, and that together we press on toward the goal of your heavenly call in Jesus Christ. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all creation, you plan to nourish the earth as your own precious vineyard. Bless fields and, and orchards and, ha- and, and hands of those who labor in them, that your people are fed with an abundant harvest of good food. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all the earth, you desire peace and justice between nations and peoples. Guide leaders of nations, states, provinces, and cities that they faithfully govern your people with wisdom, integrity, and compassion. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all compassion, in Christ you lovingly poured yourself out like wine for your people. Have mercy on all who mourn, who struggle with their mental health, who cry out with for justice, who hunger and all in, and all in any need. We especially pray for those listed in your bulletin and those who names in our hearts and minds. God's God of grace, hear our hear prayer. Our prayer. God of all steadfastness, you set in Christ as the cornerstone and foundation of the church. Build up the congregation as living stones that stands in the community of, as a witness to your enduring faithfulness and love. God of grace. Hear our prayer. God be with us as we celebrate with those who have an anniversary of their birth or marriage this week. Especially Lori Stockfist, Jim Lorstein, uh, Carolyn Steins, and TJ and Brooke May. Merciful God, hear our prayer. God of all hope, the saints who came before us lived and died with, the, with their hearts fixed on you. We give you thanks for their faithful witness, and we wait for and we wait with hope for the great day when we join their voices in praise. God of grace. Hear our prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace through Jesus Christ our Savior. Um, Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat>
Thank you. 